So I'm going to tell you about two Haskell libraries for property-based testing. And these libraries are based on the principle that properties will be tested exhaustively, but only for small values, starting with very small ones, and then uh, iteratively trying large values up to some small depth. My co-authors are Matt Mayer and Frederick Lindblad, neither of whom sadly is able to be here, but I acknowledge them now. Okay, so I guess the first question might be, I've told you what we've been working on, so question number one, well, why would we want to do that? And uh, the first answer would be something model checking people call the small scope hypothesis. So the small scope hypothesis, my version of it, is also a very common observation. If you've implemented anything and given it to other people, you will soon discover to your embarrassment that if your compiler or whatever it is fails, that ultimately some user comes up with a ludicrously simple example that makes it fail. <laughs> well, if you accept that uh, hypothesis, you are bound logically to accept its contrapositive corollary, which is, of course, <laughs> that if the program does not fail in any simple case, it hardly ever fails. These operators almost always hardly ever are modal, of course. But, uh, right. So the conclusion is obvious we should be testing these simple, these small cases. Well, there's another motivation, and that is, you'll notice that the name small check, deliberately acknowledging quick check, and um, quick check's already been mentioned during these meetings, something that's gone down very well, uh, that uh, Ridley down by Kuhn and John back in 2000, a combinate library for random testing. It exploits type classes to generate the test values. The idea is that the class called arbitrary. Types in that class have a method, arbitrary, and a suitable monad that produce random values of that kind. And then we can check universally quantified properties. These are Boolean value functions, at least in the simple case. And the idea is that for every possible argument, these property functions should return true. So we have a random generator, we throw some a collection of random arguments and see if it ever actually is false, in which case that can be reported, or as some kind of assurance, that at least for some number of random tests, everything seems okay. And as I say, this is widely used, often reported. Well, that might appear to be an anti-motivation. If all that is the case, the job is done, what are we doing? Well, there are also some drawbacks of quick failing cases are not just lying around on the ground, they're quite rare. If we now take a random sample of the possible tests, if those test cases are, the failing cases are rare, we may not actually hit any of them. If we believe our small scope hypothesis, if we carefully and exhaustively enumerate all the small values, we would hit such cases. And there are some other things, each of which, in fact, I hope to have managed to mention at the time of meeting, we manage to do something about our rat. First of all, when we do find counterexamples in quick check, they are random examples, not necessarily minimal ones. And of course, one would prefer a minimal counterexample because it will be assistance to investigate. Again, some properties have side conditions, and at random, those side conditions may be hard to satisfy, so we don't even get to test what we need to test. The standard solution to that in quick check is to write custom generators, but the art of writing custom generators can be tricky. We uh, can automate something of the, the generator, as we'll see. Then, as Sir uh, and John themselves conceded originally, perhaps one of the big weaknesses is there's no guarantee of any kind of notion of what part of the test space is being covered. Also, the properties are all universally quantified. Think about it for a moment. It doesn't really help in testing a, an existential property. Uh, the witness may be unique. You're not terribly likely to find it at random. And not finding it for a few random values is uh, hardly surprising. And finally, counterexamples of functions cannot be uh, shown. We can only say, well, I have a function that's a counterexample, but I can't show it to you. So, just briefly recapping then, I guess most people in the room are familiar with quick check, but this will also be useful background just to recap. So there's a class arbitrary, these are the types that have random value generators. <coughs> testable types are <coughs> properties, so a bool is a testable type. If you have a Boolean expression, if it's true, it passes the test, if it's false, it fails it. 
And then the magic is shown in this uh, next instance. If we have an arbitrary type A, for which we can generate random values, and a testable type B, then a function from A to B, a predicate, if you will, <coughs> the argument type A, is testable in the way already described. And the way that's actually done is shown in my last point here. There's this uh, class generic little function called <coughs> quick, quick check. We give it something testable and in a suitable uh, extension of the I.O. monad, it does what we've already indicated. Just to make quite sure we've got the idea then, here's a little example, still in quick check at the moment. Uh, think of a function, here's one that I like to think about often. Uh, and then we specify an expected property. So reading this as a property, this says for all integer lists, x's and x's prime, is preference x's, x's and x's prime. <coughs> property we would expect to hold if this prefix is being programmed correctly. So we can now test that automatically and uh, we might get something like the first exchange there or of course it could be, you'll notice this is, is prefix of the, the one in the prelude, so who knows this is prefix may have its arguments the other way around, in which case quick check might uh, discover that our property is wrong there, giving this counter example where x is, is the singleton list 1, x is prime the singleton list 2. Well, that was okay for integer lists, but uh, as I've already mentioned, in general, we may need to write our own generators, and even before we start customizing them, there's a little bit of an art to that. So here's a simple example, a usually defined type of propositions, and this is the kind of thing that one might need to write in order, as the programmer, to be able to test a program that uses these propositions. And as you can see, uh, the Sorry, the red doesn't show up terrifically, but I'm trying to pick out the red. <coughs> the way one needs to make careful use of controlling numeric parameters. And that's fine, but if you're trying to test a large piece of software with lots of data types, writing uh, all these things is at a certain disincentive. Then there are conditional properties, here's the side condition thing. So quick check okay, deals with this by having an implication operator. Notice that its result type is property rather than just all. That allows quick check to give the interpretation. But essentially, you try to test a random value. If it doesn't satisfy the side condition, you kind of throw it away as a, a doesn't count. That random value is no good. Um, so here's a little example. We represent sets as lists. Sorry, Ralph. Uh, and uh, sorry, Ranger. Uh, and we have an insertion. If we're inserting into an ordered list, we hope that it preserves ordering. And so we get uh, a property now with this antecedent condition on the left hand side. The problem is, of course, many random lists that we might generate won't in fact be ordered. Uh, so, as I say, the standard solution to that would be for a quick check user, maybe write a custom generator. But the drawbacks are we have to define that generator, and indeed we have to verify it. Are we sure that we have generated all and only the ordered lists? Well, not too difficult for that example, but for more sophisticated conditions, uh, that itself is an issue. Okay, that brings us with that background motivation. Let me now tell you about small check. So uh, the idea is to generate small values. So the first question is what's small, and the answer is what is not deep. Um, okay, well, so what's deep? But for algebraic data types, the idea is we place a bound on the depth of constructor nesting. So this little example of the uh, prop type of the suitable uh, choice of names here, just P and Q, that has depth three. That's the deepest nesting constructors again as picked out in red. For two rules, it turned out to be convenient just to maximum component depth within the library that makes it possible to identify uh, layered tuples of pairs and so on, all just as if they were flat, that happens to be a convenient choice. And of course it doesn't uh, alter the fact that you get a value of supply of values. Numbers, well that's interesting, what is a small number? For the integers it's rather obvious, for the floating point <coughs> numbers of course we certainly do not want the IEEE standard answer of what a small floating point number is, instead we want in some sense simple numbers and there's an easy way to achieve that. We take small integer pairs, SE, in, and look at the floating point numbers, S by 2 to the power of E. So I give an example there. Those are the small, that is, depth no more than two floating point numbers. We can also have small functions. I didn't mention it, quick check and uh, generate random functions. We enumerate functions, very much the same idea. Uh, but if one can think of it this way, rather than just having data constructors now, 
we of course want to have our lambda because this is a function, and we can imagine that a case discrimination on that lambda argument is just like another constructor. So we count a case as introducing one, uh, one more layer of depth. So here are, for example, the depth one bool to bool function. And yes, we can even have functional to functional arguments. That was a good head to head structure, a quick acknowledgement to Ralph Hinsink, who's uh, helped out with the current way that's done. Okay, so underneath, uh, what is this collection of tests that we, these generators, what are they? They're just functions from int to list of A's, as simple as that, where the int is the depth and the finite list of A is the list of values at that depth. So a serial type is one that has a series method of that kind. It also has a co-series method for dealing with functions. Perhaps in some, uh, when I first did this, I got into, you know, well, yeah, we must diagonalize. We had two different versions that diagonalize. Eventually, just threw that all away. These finite lists, keep it simple, and uh, it was, uh, uh, that turned out to be a, a good choice. In fact, surprising, I imagine it would be good to diagonalize in some sense. But it is the iterative deepening is uh, a separate mechanism. Actually, defining those serial instances, I don't want to labor this too much. The main thing I want to <coughs> emphasize is this <coughs> instance here. I invite you to contrast the size of that instance declaration for generating tests in small jet and the one we saw before for the same type. So here we just follow the structure of the type. We have generic operators <coughs> for some, and also the generic cons n combinator to uh, announce a constructor of our TN. And that is all we need to write. And of course it is so simple, it can be done automatically, and indeed it is done automatically by the Derive tool. Uh, thank you, Neil Mitchell and Stefan O'Rear, who wrote that tool. And uh, a similar, though admittedly slightly complicated, but it's an automatable pattern, we can define functions with another couple of combinators. Okay, I mentioned that one of the issues with QuickCheck <coughs> is that we can't see uh, functional values if they're counterexamples. Well, I suppose for a, you know, a rash moment, we doubted whether it was the case that uh, some binary operations over bool are, are not associated. You know, we couldn't immediately think of one. Or maybe we're a student and we don't know and so on. Okay, so we could write this little property which claims that in fact all Boolean binary operations are associative. And uh, because we can enumerate whether, okay, in this case there are any Booleans for whatever the data type argument, because we can enumerate it. We can use that mechanism to show something of the extension of a counterexample function. So in this case, uh, we actually get to see uh, a counterexample rather than just being told that there is one. Okay, one of the things I also mentioned is existential properties. Uh, if we are enumerating, <coughs> we can provide existentials essentially by searching for small witnesses. So there is the top. That this combination exists, so there's the <coughs> basic principle exists, exists f succeeds if, for some small argument x, testing fx succeeds. And there's the type signature again, the same magic as we had for, uh, before in the testable instance I showed you earlier. We have a serial type A, that's one for which we can enumerate the values, a testable type B, so then uh, we can then uh, test this A R B uh, function in the sense I've just described. Uh, using these existentials, I can't go into it too much, but I only ask me about it afterwards because uh, it's been sort of interesting um, learning curve to work out just how much or how little these things can do. Unsurprisingly, sooner or later, you end up wanting to write unique existentials. Sure, you can use the standard uh, sort of expansion of the kind I've indicated there, which translates away uniqueness, but notice that if you put it into a property, it would be, well, I can't seem to write and read. Uh, more importantly, it would be inefficient to test, and of course it would be limited to EQ types. So it would be no use if you were looking for a unique function. So instead, uh, the small check defines a variant exists one, uh, which actually deals with the requirement for uniqueness uh, more efficiently. And if there is not a unique witness, but there's more than one, then you get a suitable message saying, well, it's more than one witness, and for example, here are two. Uh, another issue that arises is that um, the depth. I've said that existentials are implemented by searching for a small witness. Well, how, how small? How do we search? By default, we search for the same depth as the surrounding test contact. But just as universal properties could pass test but fail deeper ones, the of course is the case for existential properties. 
they might fail at a shallow depth. Yeah, well, wait a minute, look deeper and you find the witness. So because of that, it's useful to have a little combination of attention that does a depth transformation um, on the, um, the surrounding context. Uh, it also makes, in some sense, the property more precise. It tells us just how deeply the witness is to be factual. Okay, so here's a little example. Uh, going back to our is prefix that we saw <coughs> today, uh, uh, if we were to write down an actual specification of this um, Boolean function in terms of append, we might perhaps write it as I've done there in the first item. And so the prop is prefix property I showed you before, we now, we now realize only captures half the specification. It tells us about the completeness of is prefix as a decision procedure, but it doesn't tell us about its soundness. Uh, so if we simply read off from the, uh, <coughs> the specification, it's not too difficult now. Oh, exists later to write the prop is prefix sound um, property, and we can test that. Now, at this point, a quick check user, such as John lurking in the doorway, might say, yeah, sure, but I can do that too. I just use a Skyrim function, that's all. So, a uh, quick check user can uh, magic away the existential by scholarizing, uh, for example, in this case, uh, that it might be like this. Well, that may be true. Uh, on the other hand, at the very least, you can <coughs> think about what is that scholarly function. Uh, however, more significantly, of course, it may not, there may not be a unique scholarly function, and even more significantly, you might not be able to write it if the context has, uh, is higher order. It, it, it may be very uh, difficult to write uh, at all, or indeed impossible. Okay, then there are problems of dealing with large test spaces, and this takes us into the second part of the talk and the motivation for lazy small check. So even within the framework I've shown you, given the nature of the generators, they invite pre-composition with depth adjustments or uh, composition, uh, post-composition with uh, some kind of filtering function. So here's a little example. Uh, rather than going to a, a complete blank sheet custom generator, you can in this way, in a more systematic manner, uh, annotate, as it were, uh, the previous generator we have for propositions. Suppose we want to restrict ourselves to just two variables. And suppose we wish to regard disjunctions as well. It's quite heavy, actually. I don't, I don't just think of that as adding a one to the layer of construction. I'd like or to be as if it was uh, had double depth. So we can restrict the uh, trend like that. The other technique that's useful, and again, this is one that quick check users will be familiar with, defining a new type, uh, perhaps for a custom data. Something I'd like to point out is that in the small check context, not only can we set up these uh, bijections, so here's the example where we're getting a list of, an ordered list of naturals out of any old list of naturals by just computing the partial sums. Okay. But we can test that we do indeed get all the ordered list of naturals by using uh, existentials. Okay, but even with devices of that kind, the fact is, of course, that exhaustive enumerative testing is, is expensive, and one at some point goes over the cliff. You know, at depth four, I have 50,000 tests, and that's fine. At depth five, ah, billions of tests. And that clearly is a problem, even if we buy into the small scope hypothesis. So is there anything other than devices such as the one I've got on the screen now? What else can we do? Well, of course, we should be exploiting laziness, shouldn't we? Haskell is, after all, a lazy language, and I don't think, up until this point, I've even mentioned laziness. What a disgrace. <laughs> Let's think about this function, orders, which test we've used it before, we didn't define it. This function, ordered, is being a lazy language, can, of course, give us a perfectly good result, is for a partial algebra map. Suppose we evaluate, for example, ordered, I'm sorry, I need brackets, that's also a disgrace. Anyway, you know what I mean. Uh, ordered applied to the list 1, 0, on the bottom. Yes, despite the undefined list, it's false. Huh. And we conclude then that the bottom clearly was not needed. Therefore, we could be, it could be anything. So, in fact, 1 comes 0 comes x's. Tested for x's will be false for every x's. So, in short, by applying one test, 
we found out something about an infinite family of tests. Oh, that sounds useful. They're all because of laser. So laser, that is the key idea in laser small check. We use, we test with partial values, which of course is extra testing to do, but the payoff will be that we will prune away large parts of the search space. So here's an example going back to the one we saw a moment ago. Uh, this contrasts just what we've gained, small going from small check to laser small check. Uh, this is delicate, of course. <coughs> we get into problems. Uh, I'll just speed up a little now, noting my session chair waving a piece of paper about how many minutes I've got left and so on. Uh, suppose that we strengthen the divariant for all of the lists, they're distorted, but they're moreover they're distinct elements, and suppose, just for the sake of the example, we chose to express that that way. Well, if we do that, then as we might uh, expect, the number of tests we now need is even fewer. But suppose, just to find the context the other way around, now the number of tests we have actually goes up 20 fold. Whoa, why is that? Well, of course, because uh, the standard conjunction evaluates its arguments left and right, and all depth, all diff is less easily falsified with partial values than disordered. It's, it's, it's uh, the ordering is more strict. So, the solution to that is to introduce parallel refinement of conjuncts. So, for this uh, particular example, the nice thing is that when, if we evaluate the two, two conjuncts in parallel, now we actually get fewer tests than with either of the sequential orders because we get the constraining benefit of both ordered and all diff, whichever one that gives us the most help. So, uh, there's something that you can read in the paper about exactly how this is done. Uh, the headline news I want to give you here, and I'll come back to this at the end, is that we can write the serial instances exactly the way we did before. That nice one line I showed you in small check, you can write exactly the same thing in lazy small check. But underneath, it doesn't mean the same thing, but that's the way you write it. So as a user, you are, or you're supposed to be, very happy. So rather than just a list underneath, there's now this mysterious type of thing in cons A, so the implementers among you will be the first thing to know what that is. Well, it looks like this. And the gist description of how to construct and refine things of type A, and notice uh, the last line on the right there, the possibility that it's not completely defined, it has a hole in it, and the list of bits is a path to the point in the term as a whole, uh, sorry, the, to a point in the entire term where this hole occurs, and an encoding of what type that is. And uh, the idea is that if we reach a hole, we raise a position carrying exception, and then we can refine generically uh, using the idea of a sort of universal term type uh, to get a, a refined test. Okay, there are various comparisons that you can read in the paper. Just briefly look at a couple. So here's some of the old favorites, red, black tree. So we now have not just that this is an ordered tree, but as usual, the constraint, the blackness constraint, every path from root to leaf must have the same number of black nodes. Redness, you can't have a red parent with a red child. If you take Rokasaki's very nice implementation of red black trees and inject a fault deliberately, um, and we see now whether we get preserve one of these invariant properties. Now at this point, before, uh, again, John and Cohen squeal the complaint, I want to point out, I'm doing this comparison on the basis of a blind, type-only testing. I'm not using a custom generator, which of course, no doubt they would. This illustrates what just as important the custom generators are, because we, if you just use only the type, without knowledge of that constraint, uh, you can wait a long time. Of course, small check, Running away, well, it gets down to depth four after 20 minutes when we cut it off. But laser school check, after a fraction of a second, finds a counter example. However, just pushing on, <coughs> that's because there was laziness. Here's a property which is actually quite strict. This is Hoffman compression, obviously, you want decode or encoded message to be message. Um, and uh, because this is a hyper strict property, we get all the overhead in the lazy school check. And the overhead of doing this partial testing, but we're not getting anything because the property is hyper strict. So actually, small, small check verifies to the same depth. Um, uh, right, I've been told to stop. Here's my final example for those of you who are chess players. 
Um, you can even use this to uh, make the power of laser small check to uh, almost like a logic programming language uh, in a curious way. So for those who are uh, mystified, there's the solution. Right, I must crack on. If you want to see it later, you can do that. So uh, overall conclusions, no, this is not <coughs> better than any other testing tool in particular, but there are, as I hope I've shown, there are different kinds of properties that are suited to different kinds of testing strategy. So this is complementary. And uh, here's some of the things on our to-do list. This is certainly ongoing work. And you can obtain these systems. Thank you very much. So I guess we have at least one question. Uh, th thank you, Tom. It was a very nice presentation. So I wonder about your uh, your very short one-liner definition of your your generator, uh -huh. and the the reason why it's more com yeah. the reason why it's more complicated in QuickCheck is because you don't want to uh, relate correlate the depth of the, the data structure with the depth of the elements of the data structure. So um, so for example, if you if you generate a, a a series of lists, for example, then you will get small elements at the back of the list and larger elements at the front of the list. Or when you have a tree. The elements that the leaves are typically smaller, right? you won't even cover any interesting range there, but the leaves at the leaves at the or sorry, the values at the top of the tree will be bigger. Have you thought about this? Yes. Uh, so first of all, because all the trees are in there, they may not all occur at the depth you expect. But there's a nice uniform rule for the program. And you're not sure whether your particular value you're interested in was tested at depth five. Draw me the obvious, you know, functional programming tutorial tree picture of your data map. There you go. You know, the longest path to a root is longer than the wide or whatever it is, so no, it wasn't included. So it's a nice, simple rule. So the answer is, oh, they're all there. Uh, some values may occur later depths than you might expect from some other intuition. And the, uh, the slantedness of lists, the asymmetric nature of cons, is, is, is an instance of that. Uh, the second part to the answer, of course, if you don't like that, you can use the bijection technique to uh, accomplish that. Uh, there are all sorts of projections that you can get. And that's... Yeah. Okay, I have one more question. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. so, so I, I, I skipped the slide by showing the questions very quickly. I want to ask you how you do that because it, uh, it, I don't, either I, you're cheating or it's a technique that could be used in Quisha as well. Uh, it is, it, this is not sophisticated, and in fact it's something on my to-do list to, to improve. What I'd really like to show is the actual the, the case you know, the, the case expression. This is this is pretty brutal. All you do is you, you enumerate down to some depth, you can you can enumerate the domain. But you don't know to, to, to what arguments the function is being applied. I mean now it's oh, all no. So. no, it's it is this is not a needed function. that would be another nice thing to do. To give the needed yeah. function graph. But I might quantify your function and I apply it to 100, and you will never show what f of 100 is because that might not be in the domain of your tests. That, that, that's quite correct, but remember, and, and of course the values internally could become quite large. So, uh, but the actual values we feed in the place, it, it, it feed in the first instance, are small. So there's a general whole question of well, what happens if the interesting values lie over the horizon? And something fascinating happens when you get to the buffer size, which is 50. Yeah, okay. Well, okay, I, I have a nice solution that uses unsafe performance, but we can take it offline because I don't want to play it. We'll have to because uh, we're moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so, unfortunately, we, we're out of time for any more questions, so let's uh, thank you.